Welcome to Giant Cocktails, a podcast where two lifelong fans talk about the San Francisco Giants while drinking homemade cocktails. Now, here are your hosts, Ben and Matthew Henry. Welcome to an off-season edition of Giant Cocktails. I am your host, Ben Henry, alongside my brother, just Matthew. Matthew Henry. How you doing, just Matthew, Matthew Henry? So the entire season, I'm being compared to like the, the, the Giants with all those words, and now I'm just Matthew? That's right. You're just Matthew, which you should take as a compliment, by the way, because you're way better than mediocre. Well, I feel like this is an upgrade for sure. What you've been calling me for the last, you know, six months. (laughs) So I'll take it. Yeah. This is not a backhanded compliment or just a straight up insult. No, you're you're just you. And and that's all right, man. That's as yeah. As I tell my kids, that's good enough. That's right. It is good enough. Unlike 80 and 82, which is definitely not good enough. Not good enough. No. No, I, I could go back and look at one of the adjectives you called me before to describe that, but I don't remember them all. So um, <laughs> one time I just called you mediocre, man, because I just I was just I was just done. You were out. out. Yeah, you were out of yeah. those fancy words. There's only so many words in the thesaurus that you can you can go to. Yeah. And I was also in one of those moods where I was just like, I don't want to put any effort into this. You know, none. No effort whatsoever, because yep. that's what it looked like the Giants were doing. But that's not what they're doing now. That's not what they're doing now. It's it's a whole new paradigm. It's a whole new world. And since our emergency podcast, Matthew, a lot of things have happened. And we're going to get to all of that stuff. We're going to talk about because Buster had a what he had a he had a um what do you call that when the when the 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 the, the, the Baggerleys and everybody else a press up conference they, right right yeah a conference of of press. Yes. Uh, they had one of those and they, they talked for 30 minutes and I tell you what the guys working the microphones there doing a bang up job bang up job guys nailing it out of the park I hope that you are not under over the age of 25 because if you are you should do something else but anyway uh, then also all kinds of interviews he interviewed with KMBR he interviewed with uh, uh, you know those other podcast guys yeah yeah you know he he, he and 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 he did he did some all, all kinds of stuff so we learned a lot of stuff we learned a lot of stuff about his vision for the future and how prepared he is or isn't so we are going to talk about that we're going to we're going to unpack a lot of what has happened in the past week what we've learned about the the posy hiring and then we're also going to look forward to to what kind of job he has in front of him for the off season but before we do any of those things, Matthew, I have to ask you today's icebreaker question. Okay. Are you watching the playoffs? Honestly? Honestly. N- no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm catching no. up on like Twitter and just, you know, some of the highlights and I look at the scores at the end, but the Giants aren't in it, Ben. Remember? I do. I do remember that. I, I do remember that. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm keenly aware of that. OK, actually, I'm there are some giants that. that are in the playoffs, though. There there are some giant. Well, they were in the playoffs. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Not. There were four guys from the 26 the opening day, 26 man. Well, no, there were four guys that could have been on the opening day roster, but but one of them had, had hip surgery. But three of them were definitely on the opening day roster. And and one of them was rehabbing and was going to come back and be part of Farhan's depth of starting pitching. Uh, and and yeah, those four guys made the playoffs, but three of them are no longer in the playoffs. <laughs> Maybe that was a little a bit sign. of their San Francisco Giants wearing off on them. I think exactly the mediocre medi- mediocrity has uh, was showed up at the wrong time. That's right. That's right. Like the Baltimore Orioles, who once they get to the playoffs, just roll over. Although they rolled over long ago. Yeah, they were struggling they, when the I, Giants went into town, remember? <laughs> I do. I do remember that. I do remember. That. I'd like to believe that the Giants started that, but they didn't. They didn't at all. Okay, so you're not watching the playoffs. You're not watching my man Jazz Chisholm? 
Uh, do I, his thing I, again, in I saw, front of I, no i saw on twitter how he insulted an entire fan base you know all two fans of the uh, los angeles angels of Matthew, i hear they have three fans oh my bad sorry they got married and had a baby so. yes <laughs> <laughs> all the japanese fans went to the dodgers so now there's oh just, yeah there's no they left. all yeah. switched over because they were not fans of the angels anymore that they're, they're fans of the dodgers they're right. fans of shohei and and maybe yamamoto uh yeah yeah but my boy jazz yeah you're right he insulted uh all of the fans of la when he was talking about how verdugo who drove him in for the uh, go-ahead run on their victory over the royals and one i uh, wanted to play out games game one game seven i don't know what it was <laughs> how many how many games are they playing per series 13 what doesn't matter <laughs> anyway my boy jazz he insulted the la angels by saying that verdugo had played in la not for L.A., just played in L.A. Uh, and I'm not talking about yeah. the Angels, know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> and we all knew what he meant. We all knew what he meant, but still, for some reason later, he had to apologize. You didn't have to apologize for that. We all knew what you meant. <laughs> we all knew what you meant, because like, even as much as we don't like the Dodgers here on Giant Cocktails, we, we, we all know how pathetic the Angels are. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also right. the fact that the Angels don't play in L.A. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. They don't play in L.A. Uh, but anyway, today is Sunday, October 6th, as we record this podcast. It has been one week since the end of the San Francisco Giants baseball season. And yes, we already kind of gave a playoff update, but I figured we would give more. Uh, opening day 26-man roster members, Austin Slater, Luke Jackson, and Jorge Soler, all made the playoffs just as we all hoped they would way back when. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all knocked out. But hey, at least they made it to the playoffs, unlike the rest of their teammates. However, Alex Cobb, who never played for the San Francisco Giants this year, when you look at his stats in baseball reference for years to come, he will not show up there for 2024. Yet he was there in our hearts? I don't know. But anyway, he's starting for the Guardians on Tuesday in what will be Game 3 of the series, which the Guardians are currently leading one to nothing over the Detroit Tigers, who are using the kapler Zaidi method of playing, of, you know, just absolutely ruining the culture of baseball with their openers and their pinch hitting at any time <sighs> and making it to the second round of the playoffs. <laughs> Scott Harris showing his old boss how it's done. <laughs> and, but anyway, also, in important news, the evil Padres and the more evil Dodgers, one of them will unfortunately make it to the National League Championship Series, which sucks. Um, but at least one of them won't, because they're playing each other. And I think, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Padres beat the Dodgers ten to two tonight, Matthew, in a in a game uh, that was ugly in the score, and I think ugly for baseball in general, as the Dodger fans showed their true t nature as they are wont to do. Is anybody surprised? No, not really. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, and I guess it would probably be worth noting because it, it happened since our last since our last uh, episode. Uh, the evil D bags were were knocked out. Evil. That seems strong. They're not really evil, are they? Evil in training. D-bags were knocked out of the playoffs. All right. But in more important news, this just in, Matthew, and we're going to talk about this at length today. The San Francisco Giants appointed an inexperienced 37-year-old minority owner and the only thing that he's ever done is work for famous Bay Area companies. They appointed this kid, this young, inexperienced, privileged person, as their new president of baseball opera operations. And yet somehow, at the same time, it is obviously a PR stunt. <laughs> so we're going to be talking at, in length about that today. I wanted to be the first person to, to like just whip that out there. <laughs> Am I the first person with that hot take? I don't think so. Nobody at KMBR has has started doing that yet. No, no. Well, they did say that it was good for 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 it was a good PR move, but that's not why they did it. 
Yeah, no, it was an excellent PR move. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sometimes giving the fans what they want is also a good move. Hmm. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, someone it, should tell Farhan. Some might say it's always a good move in, in an entertainment industry, but, you know, who am I to guess, to, to, to judge? Uh, uh, anyway. We are going to be talking about uh, that hiring at length today. But first, Matthew, you have to ask us our trivia question. Yeah, I know we weren't going to do one, but uh, but I felt like I feel like it's a thing and we can't just not not do it. I mean, this is our show, man, and the season is over. We can do whatever we want. All right, but I'm still doing a trivia question. All right, okay. Well, you, well, you then we're doing what we want. We're okay. What well, you want. usually I, I choose inspiration from what's happening currently to kind of poke back in the past and uh ben i'm sick um it's it's not covid it's a cold you know like I, I, those still happen apparently uh i got a cold and um and so i but it did get me thinking about covid and the 2020 season and so i thought who made the last out for the giants in the 2020 season so that's the today's trivia question who made the final uh, out? joey bart that that, that's, I might a actually, that's, a, that's a good, good that answer. That might actually be the answer. <laughs> I, I'm sorry if it is. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I threw that out there. That, that was Joey Bart's uh, rookie season. I, I will I will tell you that um, he made the uh, second to last out. <laughs> oh, that's, I was so close. You were. <laughs> I was very close. Wow. Wow. I don't usually do that. Usually I, I, I look at the answer and, and then I make an intentionally wrong uh, guess, but I don't know why I did that. I should have gone with Trump is what I should have done. I should have gone yeah, with good Trump. old Chadwick. Yeah. Oh, well. Anyway. All right. Well, we'll find out how wrong I am at the end of the show, I guess. That's right. That's right. Which was not very, not very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it time for the booze, boys? Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. And as I mentioned, Bob, I'm sick. I got a cold. I went to a conference you know, a work conference. And when you do that, you just, you know, you're sitting in a room with 700 people or whatever. It's uh yeah, it's an invitation for germs and I got sick. Uh, so today I'm drinking what I'm calling an herbal hot toddy. And it's got about five ounces of hot chamomile tea, one and a half ounces of cognac. You could use brandy, a half ounce of elderflower liqueur and one heaping teaspoon of honey. You're going to boil the water and steep your tea for a few minutes. And then you're going to add the cognac, elderflower, and honey and stir to combine. I gave a little lemon twist over the top and I'm drinking it in my San Francisco Giants mug. So that's what I'm drinking today, Bob. A herbal hot toddy. Mmm, that's a tasty cocktail. Is it a cocktail? I'm not sure. I guess it is. It could be. I don't know. I don't know. But thanks, Bob. It's good. It's got booze in it. It's good. What are you drinking, Ben? Well, thank you for asking, Bob. That is very kind of you. I believe that a hot toddy is a cocktail. Usually people have arbitrary rules around cocktails. Look, if you have to prepare it and it requires skill or at least some precision, then you can call it a cocktail. If it requires a bartender to make it, it's a cocktail. All right. Okay. Okay. It's a cocktail. It's a cocktail, then. I drank a lot of hot toddies in May when I had that horrible cold. Do you remember that? I, I do, really yeah. talk back then. That was awful. It took me like six weeks to get my voice back. Not great when you're trying to record a new podcast, I'll tell you that. And speaking of that new podcast, Matthew, it, we launched episode eight? No, six. Episode six, happy hour number three on Friday. And uh, for those of you who are curious... The show is actually doing quite well, and quite well means less than 50 downloads per episode, folks, like in case you're curious about the, how this whole podcasting thing works. I was just impressed uh, with the 4,933% increase over last month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's when you have one download, and I think that one download was like me testing it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the previous month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That that's what happens. Uh, the podcast is going quite well, but it's still, yeah, we're, we're well below 50 downloads, uh, but we are certainly doing way better than Giant Cocktails did in its early days. And in case you're wondering, yes, we get way more than 50 downloads per episode on this show, folks. Way more. Yeah. Can you believe this, folks? There's 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 thousands of you. 
not not every episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all cherry pick the episodes, but uh, yeah, 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 no. yeah. There are thousands of you. This is weird. That's weird. Yeah. It's weird to me. But anyway, yeah. uh, yes, uh, but definitely not every episode. Not even close. You guys like to cherry pick. Man, in June when the Giants are hot. And in December, when you all think we're going to sign Aaron Judge, man, you guys just come you come out of the woodwork. <laughs> Not to but mention anyway. when we fire Safarhan Zaidi. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. That might become our biggest downloaded episode ever. It's getting there. It's close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the Zaidi fired, Posey hired. You are a hopeful lot. You are a hopeful <laughs> lot, but you are also a hungry lot. You're hungry for hope is what you are. And I can appreciate that because I'm right there with you. But I'm also thirsty for alcohol. And so what am I drinking today? Well, I am drinking a cocktail that we featured on The Perfect Sip in the Happy Hour episode on Friday, which was a Venus Gin Number no. 2 Old Fashioned. And if you want to hear more about that cocktail and more about old fashions in general, then I suggest you go listen to the Friday episode of The Perfect Sip. And you can find a link to that in the show notes for this episode of this podcast right now. But listen to this first, then go listen to that one. Okay. Okay. So what's in a Venus number two, gin number two, old fashioned? Well, it has two ounces of Venus gin number two, which is a nice barrel aged gin out of the Venus distillery from Santa Cruz. That's cool. And it also has a quarter ounce of simple syrup and two dashes of orange bitters and a lemon twist. Of course, I used three extra fancy uh, cherries in mine on Friday. Today, I'm just doing the lemon twist. To make it, you combine the gin, the simple syrup, and the bitters in a mixing glass with ice. You stir that for 15 to 20 seconds. Then you strain it into an old-fashioned glass with a large chunk of ice. Then you express the oils from your lemon twist over the cocktail and drop that right into the glass. And that's what I'm drinking today, Bob. A Venus Gin Number no. 2 Old Fashioned. Mmm. That's a tasty cocktail. It, it's very good. It's very good. It's all about this gin. This gin is good. Yeah, it is good. The barrel aged, man, that makes a little difference there. Mm-hmm. It really does. Really does. Do you think? Do you think Buster Posey uh, drinks uh, gin old fashions? Uh, you know, I don't. He's so sophisticated. You, he's like all skinny now, and he's got like gray hair on the temples. Yeah, Damn. I think it's. He's probably having a glass of Merlot or something, right? No, he's not having a glass of Merlot. God, it's insulting, Matthew. <laughs> he's having a nice Pinot. <laughs> Pino, Are you okay. kidding me? Okay, all right. Jeez. I don't know anything about wine. I just live here. I don't know. I don't know anything. Those are, I just the words I just came out of my mouth. I have no <laughs> idea what that meant. I was basically doing a scene from that old wine movie Sideways, <laughs> when when that guy just goes insane about Merlot and he's just dropping f bombs about it. And I'm like, oh, I guess we shouldn't drink Merlot anyway, which I do know really hurt the wine industry. That one scene in that one movie. Oh, interesting. I so I, I just a real quick aside. You know, when I moved here to Sonoma County, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't know anything about wines, and I was very nervous about that because I work in a role where I have to like meet people, and wine is a big part of the culture, and you're you know giving bottles of wine as gifts and all that sort of stuff. And so I, one of my board members happens to be um, his name is synonymous with a big winery here in Sonoma County, and I met with him, and I was like. I confessed that I didn't know anything. And he told me something that made me feel really good. He said, there's no such thing as a bad wine. There's only wine that you like and wine that you don't like. And he said, so don't really, you know, follow what other people say. Try all the wines that you, you know, and and just decide what you like. And that was really good advice because, um, yeah, there are some wines that I've learned that I really love and some that I'm like, no, don't really like this one at all. And depending on the winery, it could be the same, uh, you know, grape. And uh, just different different uh, ways of, of coming out of the bottle, I guess. I don't know. So it's it's uh, so don't let anybody tell you that uh, you know you have to have a certain wine. It's whatever you like. All right. Well, then fine. That I'm going to drink my boxed Merlot Second Crush, and that's just the way it's going to be. Okay. Good for you. Yeah. All right. Tip it. Tip it. <laughs> oh, Kathy Griffin. When he's talking that's about her right. mom and her wine. Tip it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the box, boxes, right? the box yeah, is like yeah, at the very yeah. bottom. You're trying yeah. to get the last bit of wine out. Yeah. I mean, I just stand there in front of the fridge and just shake it right? <laughs> yeah, over your head and just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Open your mouth yeah, yeah. and just like, yeah. yeah. You, drink yeah. A, you drink Merlot really cold, right? 
Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. yes, sir. <laughs> okay, okay, well, good, good. So I'm doing it right. All right. Well, yeah. So you asked me, do what uh, do I think? Merle, what it, you basically asked me, what do I think Buster Posey is doing right now? Yes. Well, he probably just put the kids to bed, and I think you're right. He probably is having a nice glass of wine while he's reading about the San Francisco Giants. That's what he's doing right this second. You know, Matthew, when we when we were designing the off season uh, episodes planning these we, we figured that Farhan was going to be kept and then we were going to have a whole reasons for why Farhan should be fired so I had to cram all of that into our Monday episode yeah you did a good job and thank you thank you thank you I thought I'm going to some it sounded a little like maybe I was overthinking that maybe I think about this too much but folks I have a podcast about the San Francisco Giants <laughs> that I spend money on there's, so, so, so the signs any, were any, there. If anybody's going to be thinking about the San Francisco Giants or overthinking, it should be us, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So if you think I was overthinking it, yes. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, if I didn't have this as an outlet, you know, my wife who loves the Giants would have divorced me by now because she would have just said, you know, at a certain point, it's just too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's how much that's how much I do this. But anyway, that we were supposed to talk about. It. So today what we're going to talk about is Buster Posey and what we have learned since Monday when this was announced. But since then, all kinds of things have happened. We had the news conferences. Buster sent me an email. OK, they, they sent it to a lot of people, but 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 still, he sent me an email to tell me what he was going to do. And he, I have to admit, the email didn't really say a lot, but it was very nice. And I thought it was very, very polite. And uh, but there were a lot of quotes and and I felt like there was a lot of clear information that was given, certainly about like how this came about. And there are some things that we learned, I think, about like just how this all happened, because Buster was on Farhan Zaidi's team playing for Gabe Kapler in 2021. Yeah. And then. In 2022, he was retired in Georgia, back in his home state, in his hometown, I guess, living the retired life. That was two years ago. And now and now he's the president. Now he's Mr. President. Like, how did we go from there to here? Well, I think we learned a few things. We will have how that happened. One, does it sound like Buster wanted it? Yeah, but but if we if we want if we follow your little analogy or your storyline, though, mm-hmm. first he moved back from Georgia to the Bay Area. Right, 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 and that seems to be true. Like I I did wonder, oh, this is why he came back. Like that was my first thought. Oh, this was this was this was fate accompli. This was this was this was the plan from the beginning. But no, that turns out that's not true. Like like they legitimately missed the Bay Area and wanted to come back. So that that we, part of the story is true. We all know it was his wife. Right, yeah. she missed the Bay Area. He was just bored. Yeah, he was right. bored. You could play yeah. golf anywhere, but man, he was just bored. Yeah, like you can only fix so many floorboards, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, like, what mm-hmm. are you going to do? You There's know, only so right? many P-traps that need to be fixed. Yeah, <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. And then at a certain point, you're like, man, I'm used to stretching out my hip and then hitting 100 balls and then watching three hours of film. And like, I, I need something to do. And so he so he went back to work for the Giants. And what was interesting is, is that in a lot of the conversations that were had with Greg Johnson, who is the chairman of the executive board for the Giants, it was he made it very clear that this was sort of a, 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 a an aspiration, I think, that he had for Buster sometime down the line. And, and I, I can totally see that and I totally believe it. And he was like, this is way sooner than we thought it would play out which also makes total sense, right? This is something yeah. that, he, that that Johnson envisioned happening over years, not months. Um, but it was something that they saw eventually happening, but it was very clear because both Melvin and Johnson, I don't even, I think they used the same analogy, which was when Buster asks for the ball, you give it to him. Or when a guy like Buster asks for the ball, you give it to him. And then Buster literally made it clear, I think, in an interview with both Pavlovich and KNBR on the day of the press conference, that this is something he wanted to do and he said he wanted to do it. But it also sounds like that request didn't happen until very recently, late, late, late August, September, like after the Chapman signing yeah. is when this commitment was verbally, when this was made 
to Johnson. But yeah, Buster asked for this job. And if Buster hadn't asked for this job, there's a very good chance that Zaidi would still have it. Not 100%. Johnson said that decision hadn't been made yet. But that is, yeah. Wow. That's yeah, a big I mean, deal. so Bust, Buster staged a coup. Wow, it sounds bad when you say it like that. But you know what? Yeah, yeah, I was right there with him. I had my, I was, I was pull, I was raising up arms. I was sharpening my pitchfork, and I was like, "I'll be the first one to die for you, Buster." <laughs> Me too, man. I was right behind you. I was like, "But him first. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. Um, Actually, I'd be behind you one because I'm more out of shape, and I would have blown a hammy. Yeah, you would have. Yeah, and I would have been like you would. Have, I, you would have had like one le- arm draped over my shoulder, like my yeah, neck, as I'm yeah. dragging you through. Yeah, yeah, and I'd uh, be like, "Ah, they got me." <laughs> oh, anyway, getting back to uh, this, I, the Chapman extension though was it sounds like kind of the turning point. Like that was the the time where Buster kind of realized that that's this is what he needed to do. But he did say that it had been brewing in his mind for a while. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know that 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 speaks to that there's been some dissatisfaction particularly from buster you know maybe from day one you know when or or at least when he came back in the ownership group and started having more you know maybe intricate kind of insights into the front office uh yeah so that was really interesting to me that uh that that he had been thinking about it for a while uh, but the Chapman extension, you know, and it was funny to hear him talk about Boris because, uh, you know, he kind of gave a little jab to Boris uh, during the uh, KMBR that was, interview. It was so beautiful. That was so beautiful. <laughs> you know what? I, I, if I remember, I will put a link to that in the show notes, folks. The KNBR YouTube video of the interview with Buster right around the five minute mark. He makes a comment about Scott Boris, which is sort of like, wow, this is now the president of baseball operations for the San Francisco Giants being like, oh, I guess Scott Scott will tell you what how it went. Yes, I was a little sarcastic. It was, I mean, very uh, sarcastic. It was a sarcastic comment. And what I like about that is that the gloves are off. You know, he's yeah. not going to be like, oh, Mr. Diplomat. He's like, no, we're on opposite sides of the table and. You know, he'll tell you that, you know, kind of thing. It was it was funny. I, I had a good laugh. I'd love that. I loved it. Right. I mean, who doesn't love casting Scott Boris as the is the evil villain? Oh, man, we could we probably have five episodes at least of that. You know? Yeah, I- indeed. Agreed. And 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 at the same time, he represents a, a bunch of significant giants and, and a guy that maybe the Giants want to sign again. Although I, I'm not sure, because Buster gave a very diplomatic answer when people asked him about about Blake Snell. But I, I think that that point, the question of whether or not the Giants want to pursue Blake Snell really brings up a good question of like, what was it about how the Giants were doing things that made Buster want this job? You know, because clearly it's like, if, if you want the job, it means that you're not happy with the way that people are, are doing the job right now. Well, right. And he he said a few things that were very telling, I think, in several interviews. He kept repeating the same things. One was crisp, clean baseball or clean, crisp baseball, I think is how he put it, which seems to be a knock on maybe the coaching staff or, you know, the players and the way the game they were playing the game. And then wants teams well prepared. He mentioned that several times, several times, well prepared. Yeah. So I, it makes me wonder, like, is is he is he satisfied with, you know, the way the, the coaching staff approaches the, you know, preparing the players? Is, you know, what what is it about well prepared? Like, who, where does the onus fall? That's a great question. and I, I don't think we know. Like, you know, we talked about this. I think I think we talked about this during the, the, the Zaidi emergency podcast on Monday where where I said that it was that the the minor league players looked like they were coming up and they were the guys that were making a lot of the mistakes. And and I conjectured, I think, if I didn't, I should have, and I'm going to now, that the Giants weren't doing a good job coaching the fundamentals to their younger players in the minor leagues. Like, whatever it was they were trying to accomplish, that wasn't a focus. And that that was one of the reasons why a lot of these guys come up and like the pitchers don't know how to hold runners. And a lot of them don't break for first base when they should on on ground balls to the right side. And and then a lot of these guys don't know where they should line up 
four throws, of, you know, from the outfield, et cetera, et cetera. They don't know how to run the bases. They don't know how to read the situation. They don't, you know, there's just so many different things that we saw be problems. A lot of those were problems from the younger players. And and it's not on Bob Melvin, certainly not on Bob Melvin in year one, <laughs> to make sure that the young players who he's never coached know those things. On the other hand, it was his team making those mistakes. And and so I guess the question is, like, you're absolutely right. Who is the onus on? I, I think it's I, I it, it could be either. It could be both. Yeah. Well, it, it also it makes me think like. I mean, they won when Buster's last season, it was the, the 107 win season uh, and it was under Kapler. And I just remember that that was our first year of podcasting. And so there was a lot of talk from the media about how prepared and how much they coach these players, you know, uh, on a day to day basis. And we heard a lot from the media around, you know, the the hitting coaches and their approach, as well as, you know, uh, Kai, was it uh, Kai Correa and, and his work with the infielders around defense and Alyssa Necken and her work with the with the base running. And we heard a lot about that. And you don't hear about that at all anymore. And I don't know if that's just the message has been changed or if they're just not emphasizing it anymore. And it just it seemed like that that could be the case. And it made me think, Ben, would will Bob Melvin be the manager beyond this season? I don't think that's guaranteed. I don't. And and somebody literally asked Greg Johnson that question during the um, during the press conference, and he was like, "That's not my decision. That's Buster's decision." But I think it was a good point. I, I think number one, Bob Melvin is the manager for next year. There's there's zero intent of changing that. Although, I mean, I say zero and, and, you know, what do I know? I guess that could change. It seems very unlikely that they would change it. To me, it seems like a very sane thing for a first time president of baseball operations to let the year play out and 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 then just make a decision when you actually have the ability to have a clean opening, right? Because because Melvin has an option, a team option for for 2026 and they would probably talk about an extension uh you know during the 2025 that, season during oh. the 2025 season and i think that you could play you could let the season play itself out a little bit or maybe buster doesn't need that much time but certainly i think he needs time to sit down with melvin and figure out if they mesh or if they don't but i don't think he needs to rush and sign him but no i don't think there's any guarantee that melvin is going to be the guy after 2025 I expect him to be the guy for 2025, though. And yeah, it'll be an uncomfortable situation if they don't extend him. But I don't think Buster Posey's going to care. Like, I don't. No, I and and I, I, you know, I, I sit in a pretty high role in my organization, and you know, you have to make decisions based on what you know to be the right decision, not based on what other people think. So Buster will make the right decision based on what he thinks for sure. Uh, also, just just as an aside, though, I want to talk about that 21, 20, that 21 team really quickly. I'm looking at the ages of all the players. Maurizio Dubon played tw- 74 games, and he was 26. That is the oldest player. That is the youngest player to play more than 60 games for the Giants that year. Yeah. And, and there were very few young guys. The guys that were 25 or younger who played the most games was Zach Littell who appeared in 60 games at 20, age 25. And then Tyro Estrada was 25, and he played in 52 games. So that was not a young team. No. Right? And that was not a lot of guys. So those were guys who knew how to play baseball. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. the preparation, you know, when they were prepared, I don't, you know, they, they were probably making sure that guys were keeping up on the little things, but they were probably giving them a lot of analytics, giving them a lot of tools. And so that was the kind of preparation that Kapler was bringing every day. But he also had a very veteran team of guys who knew how to play baseball already. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So they weren't necessarily having to teach fundamentals. Yeah. So the question then becomes, Matthew, there was some interviews with with Greg Johnson, who we don't get a lot of. You don't get a lot out of Greg Johnson. You don't. Yeah. There are not a lot of Greg Johnson quotes out there. And, and Greg Johnson, by the way, is the chairman of the executive board for the Giants, San Francisco Giants ownership. As you may or may not know, the San Francisco Giants do not have a single majority owner. So there is no one person individual who can just make all of the decisions for the team. 
and not have to listen to anybody else. It is a consortium of individuals and they elect or choose a board and that board has a chairman and then that person just becomes the de facto owner of the team because Major League Baseball requires that you have one person and one person only in that role. And I believe... I'm not 100% sure who officially holds that right now, because I know that Greg Johnson is the chairman of the executive committee, but that position might actually be Larry Bears. Anyway, not important. Point is, Johnson is the chairman of the executive owners, executive board. Buster Posey is a member of that board. Buster will remain a member of that board. This is not an unusual arrangement in the business world. I know that to some people think that might be a little weird. It, this is not unusual in the business world at all to have a member of your board also be an executive in the company, especially the the head executive. Although Buster's not the head executive, he's the head of well, baseball. Usually when you hear the title president and CEO, it means that they're on the board and right. they're the chief executive. So uh, businesses happen all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So not unusual. But Greg Johnson, he's like sort of the head of the whole organization, at least as a figurehead. Um, and he's elected there by his fellow owners or appointed there by his fellow owners, but he doesn't talk a lot. But but the whole ownership group doesn't talk a lot. But they he did talk a lot. And I think uh, there was a couple things that I thought were really interesting quotes out of him. He he really bagged on the one and one deals. And he didn't say Michael Conforto's name out loud, but man, I, I think he might listen to our show. And every time he heard me moan and groan about Michael Conforto, he was probably cheering me on. Because uh, he was not a fan of the one on one deals. And he um, he definitely said it, it, it had a negative impact, not just in the fact that it it meant that the players, if the players did poorly, which he definitely directly called out, they came back for another year. And if they did well, they left. But he also said he felt like it had a negative impact on the culture of the team because players were playing for themselves, not for their teammates. So I thought that was really interesting. That was a thing that he said that he really he really didn't like. Um, the other thing was is that Pavlovich asked him a sort of open-ended question that I think he could have chosen to answer in a number of different ways. But Pavlovich asked him, like, what do you what do you want the culture or of this team to be? And Greg Johnson immediately started talking about how this team plays baseball. I really thought he was going to say something like, I want to be a team that respects our heritage and respects our history and pays respect to the you know players that came before us. Buster Posey said a lot of that. But Greg Johnson was immediately to like, I want to be a team that can get the bunt down and plays good fundamental baseball. And, <laughs> and so I think that's a great sign. Like, you know, number one, it demonstrates that, that Greg Johnson is a huge baseball fan. And, and that's what you want out of your owners. You want owners to be baseball fans first. And that should really be the only reason they own a team. If you have an owner who's owning the team for for status or God help you profit, then then you got a bad owner. Um, So that was a good sign. And I, I was happy to hear that. But getting back to Buster Matthew. He's got a lot of work in front of him. He's got a, he's got a, he's got a lot of things to do. He's got to do like like I said, he's just put the kids to bed right now. He's having his glass of wine and now he's reading about how to be a hobo. Right? He's he, he's reading hobo hoboing for dummies. Uh-huh. uh-huh. And hopefully he's got the right version. He's got the one that's not 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 about how to catch a train, but but how to train baseball players. Right? Hopefully. Yeah. So I know that he said a, he said a few things. Like one of the first things he has to do is he has to hire a GM, and 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 what he's going to do in that he's 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 really looking for a GM who's going to to emphasize the importance of scouting. Although people did ask him about analytics, and he said, you know, you, you can't you can't get away from analytics in the modern game. But he also wants to have a GM who has a lot of scouting experience. And I didn't know if that meant because like he doesn't or or what, but but anyway, it got me thinking. Okay. In an alternate universe, Matthew, I'm the owner of the Giants. Oh, I like this universe. And and I and I and I, and I just fired. I just I just I just I just gave uh, Farhan his walking papers, and uh, because I literally just took over the team first 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 thing I did. You know that I did. I rolled in there. Well, first I changed the chair. I had to get a better chair in the office. But then the second thing I did is I, I let Farhan know that he was he was not going to be needed. 
And uh, and I looked at my options and I saw Buster over there just raising his hand. You know, he's like, he's, he's like, he's on his tippy toes and he's like, oh, me, 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 me. <laughs> and then there you are sitting in the back room. You're just eating a snack. It's on your shirt. It's on your face. And then I point at you and I say, you, you're my new hobo. What's the first thing you do, Matthew? What are the first things that you do as hobo? The first thing that I do as hobo after I'm just sitting there eating my snack and you point to me and yeah. uh, tell me I'm a hobo? You're hired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I whip out my phone and I type in, I have been named president of baseball operations for the San Francisco Giants. <laughs> I am new to do. this role. What are the first 10 things I should do to be successful? So <laughs> ChatGPT is my friend, Ben. And uh, <laughs> so I have, I have prepared this. Okay. And uh, Chat GPT says, congratulations on your new role. As president of baseball operations for the Giants, you'll have significant influence on the team's success and long-term vision. Here are hmm. 10 things to focus on to set yourself up for success. Okay. Okay. And and there's there's I'm just gonna do the the high level, but there okay, it gives not, me good stuff. Yeah. I, but I, I will okay. one, evaluate the current roster. Mm. Two, build a strong front office team. Three, strengthen player development. Four, evaluate your manager and hire a visionary manager if needed. Analyze past trades and free agent signings. Develop a free agency strategy. Engage with analytics. Foster team culture, communicate with fans, and craft a long-term vision. Whoa. Okay. Do you, do you think I, Buster asked ChatGPT what he should do? Because that sounds I, that sounds a lot like the stuff he was saying this past I, week. I hundred percent think that Buster whipped out his phone <laughs> and typed in ChatGPT. Like I just. <laughs> I mean, it would be hard not to, right? It would be hard not to. <laughs> Like, You're new to a role, man. Like you, you got. Yeah. You want to know at least where am I heading in the right direction, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. Let's just see what 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 the you know everybody would do, because that's essentially what's happening there. I do like that it said analytics. It it called out analytics. You got to do it. Got to yeah. do it. You know. It, it also said communicate with fans. Well, he sent which, me that email. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't get the email, man. I'm, you I'm didn't get the email. Bit. Oh, well, then I'm maybe he did only send it to me. It was definitely from him, but it did it didn't say dear if, Ben. I guess if you were a season ticket holder at any point in time, you probably got that email. Yeah, that's that's I I, I think I think that is what it was. <laughs> I just reached on to you and your <laughs> ticket, so I didn't have to be one. Uh <laughs> let's see. A message from Buster Posey. Here it is. Here it is. Dear fans. Oh, dang it. See, yeah, no, it wasn't it, even personalized. It wasn't it personalized. Didn't say dear ben. No, it doesn't say dear dear Ben. It says dear fans. It doesn't even say dear fan. No, you know? he's talking to us as the collective. So I did. He's talking to me too. He is. He is talking to you. Yeah, you're a fan. You're a fan. And and I gotta say, uh, he says after meeting with the media earlier today to talk about the news of my new role as the hobo. Oh, I'm sorry, pobo. I, I wanted to reach out to you directly. I wanted to reach out to you directly. To let you know how excited I am for what we will build together to bring championship baseball back to San Francisco. And then he proceeds for two more paragraphs, Matthew, to say nothing clearly. Like, it doesn't say whether he's going to sign Blake Snell. No. It doesn't say who, what kind of approach they're going to take on the field. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say whether or not Mike Yastrzemski is going to be tendered or not. Nothing. He doesn't tell me anything. But, but go back to that last thing that you read, though. We together? Something like that? Did, did... Um, I'm excited for what we build together to bring championship baseball so, so, back to San Francisco. So I'm. So that means he's taking like advice. It do does. Think, it do, does. Do you, think I, do you think I could just give him a call <clears throat> and you know give him some thoughts? I don't think you need to. He clearly listens to the show. It's Buster, DM me, man. All right, <laughs> we'll talk. Well, maybe maybe we should give him. I've some got advice. some really good ChatGPT prompts for you, Buster. <laughs> Let's... Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it, we don't have any advice, but we can tell you how to get really good results out of chat GPT. And you know what? Matthew has become an expert because every midweek review he. Well, actually, now that I think about it, he has not gotten chat GPT how to stop calling me Sultan. Yeah, I, I, I actually <laughs> have to be like, don't call him Sultan if I want him. <laughs> chat GPT really likes the word Sultan. Anyway, yeah. I, yeah. Well, that is true. You have to tell it be very, very clear in the prompts. You have to be like, no, I need to win the World Series every year. You know, you need to be explicit yeah. about what you want. Yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah. That is true. All right. Well, seriously, though, 
I mean, what what <laughs> like this is a question I think a lot of people have. And and he was very open about this. He is not experienced, right? He has to go learn on the job. And he he said this right in the press conference. People said, What would people say? What would you say to people who say you're not experienced? He would say, I think that's fair. <laughs> 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 and, and, and he very well might have had had this conversation with Chat GPT or have the hoboing for dummies book, you know, in his mm-hmm. in his um what 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 do what do millennials carry his satchel. Tim, his Tim his... book his satchel. Yeah, he's got a satchel. <laughs> <laughs> that they might actually they might. He's got his his vintage leather satchel. <laughs> Well, I, I, I've actually, you know, well, the first time I was a CEO of a YMCA, let's just, that's what I do, uh, was not to the YMCA that I'm currently at. I didn't know what I was doing. It was my first time being at that level of heading an organization. And so I, yeah, I had to, I had to figure it out. And the way you figure it out is by asking people around you how to do things. And so that's, that's the secret. And it sounds like Buster has that secret. Like he knows that he's got to be with, uh, you know, get with people like Brian Sabian and and uh, and and others to to figure out what he needs to do. So I I have no doubt that Buster will surround himself with good people, and uh, you know, it sounds like he's already seeking the advice and sage counsel of people like Brian Sabian. And just because he's new doesn't mean he won't be good, and it doesn't mean that he can't figure it out because you know everyone was new at a job you know, once in their lives. And so, uh, you know, and, and I, I have no doubt that he will, he will figure it out and, and be good at it. But, uh, yeah, so I don't think we can, we'd have to really worry too much about him being a first time guy, uh, just because you don't know like, all the ins and outs doesn't mean that you can't be successful. Well, it's not like he doesn't know baseball. Exactly. Right? And, he, and he certainly knows baseball in a way, way better than Farhan Zaidi did. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, I, I knew the YMCA. I didn't know about mod rates for, uh, for insurance. Like purposes, uh, you know, and and I, I didn't know all the little things behind, but you, that's where you got people, and you just you know ask people like, what are these things, and they explain it to you, and then you you make informed decisions. That's right. You can totally have somebody explain to you what the weenus is and why it needs to go up and not down. Exactly. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. the yeah, weenus. You know, you look at the weenus and it's down. It is not good. <laughs> Definitely not good. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So, what do you what do you think in the last few minutes? What do you think are the first things that Buster needs to do going forward? Like, what what are the mm. broad things? Because okay. I thought maybe what we could do is we could we could we could figure out what he's going to do next, and then we could beat okay. him to the punch, oh. and then then every week we could talk about it, and then he could you know zag when we zig, and then when he screws up, well, we could say like, oh, you should have done it our way. Okay. okay. Well, and then when yeah, he does well, we won't bring up he that we should. Were wrong. Okay. Okay. A top five things he should evaluate the current roster. Build a no, strong front office it, team, stop. strengthen player development, hire a visionary manager, and analyze past trades and free agent signings, Ben. I thought we went over this. Stop it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I, I, I think the... But there are I mean, some truths to that. That stuff, is totally right? I mean, true. I, I, we that, agree, Matthew. We, I, I agree. Chat GPT knows what it's doing. That, that's why it's a revolutionary <laughs> technology. I get it. I get it. Okay. Well, I, I, you know, the, the first one is, is, you know, he's got to assess the personnel, right? I mean, not only the players, but the coaches. If you want to make changes and you don't like the way things look on your baseball team, Ben, you can't keep doing the same things. That's right. And so there will need to be changes to be made. And so that's yeah. number one, right? Who's going to go? What seat are people going to sit in? What are they going to do? Who are you going to bring in? All that has to be decided because one thing's for sure, you can't just keep doing the same old things you've done for the last six years. Yeah, and I think I think Bob Melvin will likely stay, but I think there will be big changes on the coaching staff. That is, that is almost clear. Um, and then there will probably be changes to things that we don't see. And maybe they'll bring back some of the things that 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 existed under Kapler. You know, if Buster thought those things were useful when he was a player. But the one thing that is clear to me, like, and and he brought up a term that man, it stuck with me. And I, you know, I I had heard it briefly in the past because you know, yeah, I'm in management too, and I hear all these things. But man, you know, it's like for his GM, he's looking for somebody that he called a servant leader. Yeah. And it's very clear that what he wants to do is create an organization where you 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 get the best players you can. Because that was another thing that he said, is he wants to get the most talented players on the field. 
And I that was it, it felt like he was saying something there, but it wasn't clear enough to know exactly what that meant. But in my mind, I wanted to believe that was a dig at the one on one contracts and at the <laughs> bargain hunting. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, the idea of servant leadership, though, is that, you know, you are serving those who are underneath you. You are making sure their needs are met and that they are taken right. care of and and that they will they will that. And the theory is that they will perform at a higher level because of that. And and so how does that play out on a baseball team? You know, I, when I first heard it, it made me think of maybe the 49ers in the 80s when, you know, they were their ownerships were, you know, really taking care of their players and there wasn't a salary cap back then. They could do those kind of things, but they were paying them more and doing all that. Um, so I just I feel like there's there's some things that you can do to make your your players happier and and uh, your, you know perform better. Right. And I think I think at the end of the day, that's what the whole organization needs to be about. It needs to be about making the players the best that they can be. And part of that is like the the people in management who oversee other people who are not part of the players. Right. But they are part of baseball operations are empowering those people to do those things. One thing that is interesting to me is that. So, yeah, he's got they're going to review the coaching staff and there are going to be changes there without a doubt. I heard a lot of people talking about player development, and it certainly sounds like Kyle Haynes' job is safe. He is the head of player development, and I, that's a name that I have mentioned as having doubt in. Of course, I know squat about squat, right? Like, I, I don't know anything about player development. It's a dark art. Like, I'm pretty sure that half of Major League Baseball teams don't know anything about player development. And so so it is a, it is a dark, dark art. So I, I, I totally recognize that I don't have any sort of um, expertise to evaluate somebody, but I really feel like Kyle Haynes has got to go. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the professor of dark arts always gets... Always that's getting right, always place. gets... Always, 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 that's right, it gets axed <laughs> every year. That's <laughs> right. Um, so, so, so that is interesting. So, uh, you know, that, that Kyle Haynes for, for, for now seems to be safe, but it did also sound like a lot of the people are going to remain, but maybe the roles they're going to be in are different. Well, starting with the general manager, right? Pete Patilla is getting right, reassigned. Right. Well, that is you interesting because so- I, I was listening to him and uh, Ben Caspic said something interesting on Locked on Giants about how, like, you know, you are free to to interview with other teams and take a job if the job that you're taking is a promotion. There is right. very there are very few roles above GM, right? Because GM used to be the top role. It used to be the hobo, but then we had title inflation. And so now yeah. GM is a little bit of step below the hobo. And um, if you want to be hired as a GM somewhere else, you got to be demoted. <laughs> so I, I think in, in a sense that... that so they're that doing him a favor. Then, they're doing him regards. a favor, I think, by moving him out of the GM role so then he can interview at other places and then just freely go. Um, but I don't know if that's a rule because it, it seems to me that was just like a courtesy. So they could just let him do whatever he wants uh, in that sense. But it, it sounds like they don't want to terminate him, but he's not going to be the GM. Yeah. So, yeah, but it could also be true for many other people in the organization. So I'm very curious to see what ends up happening on the player development side. And then, of course, there's all the roster decisions, Matthew, the arbitration and the team options and the free agents and all of that stuff is going to come super fast. He has, I think, until the day after the World Series before these things start happening. That's when team options and player options are need to be made within one day of after the end of the world series. There aren't too many decisions they need to make there. Um, I am still pretty sure that Flores will take his option. Um, and then at that point, but he'll have to decide what to do with Wilmer Flores at that point. I'm pretty sure that Robbie Ray will take his option for two years, which, you know, nothing the t- team can do about that. And then they have five days to negotiate with Mark Canna, and Michael Conforto, and somebody I'm forgetting. Oh, Blake Snell. Kirk Casale. Oh, that's right, Kirk Casale. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they'll have five days to uh, to negotiate with Blake Snell. Uh, uh, do you think they'll do? Do you think they'll do anything there? Uh, I- I think they'll talk to him. Uh, there's no way they're signing him in those first five days. Yeah, no way. But, uh, you know, because that's just the way Boris rolls. I will say that I don't think Blake Snell is going to allow it to drag on like it did last no, year. No, Blake Snell with. is signing before spring training. You can you can <laughs> write that one in stone. Uh, yeah. 
that guy that guy is not dumb. That's one thing I learned about Blake Snell, and and he understands how important that is. That deal will get done before spring training. Agreed. All right. Well, so I think that Matthew, I think you're right. The first thing that he's got to do is he's got to evaluate his personnel. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Next week, we're evaluating personnel. We're going to talk about the entire coaching staff. Matthew wrote all their names down. Uh, There's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Name the most obscure name. Uh, The most obscure name? Oh, you want? Okay. Oh, you want to go there? Okay. Yeah, I do want to go there. Um, Give me the Mike Bauman. Come on. uh, How about Fernando Perez? Fernando Perez. Um, Perez. Perez. Mm, what does what does he do? What what does what does he do? He's the director of video coaching. <laughs> the director of video coaching. Wow. But he's ranked. He's listed on the website as a coach. Okay, I feel like I, I should know Tiara U- Uematsu. Yeah. U- U- Uematsu. He's a great story. He used to be just the bullpen uh, catcher. Oh. Uh, a few years ago, and right. then he got he got uh, promoted to an actual assistant coach under Gabe Kapler. Kapler, yeah, Kapler did crap like that. Man, that guy was. He's a good right. story. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. he was looking for a diversity in his in his uh, in his mm-hmm. coaching staff. Yeah, I think the name that everybody's going to be pointing at is Justin Veely. But anyway, we'll be talking about all those names and more next week. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. No, it's time for the answer to the trivia question. Oh, well, that's what I'm. That's the that's the that's the beginning of the goodbye. Oh, okay. We answer okay. the we answer the the trivia questions while while everybody's getting their coats right and and, this and is putting true. their coats on right. Yeah, and I'm taking the glasses away from people so they they stop drinking. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, I'm sick. I've hit the mute button on my mic more times today than I have ever done that. It'll be interesting to see how it sounds on the uh, audio. Way better. Uh, But uh, the question was, who made the last out for the Giants in the 2020 COVID season? And the answer was uh, 2024 playoff bound player Austin Slater. Whoa. Yeah. (laughs) Rejoice, Slater haters. Uh Uh, so that's that's the the trivia question, um, and I think that's gonna gonna do it for us, Ben. Folks, don't forget to follow us on the socials at Giant Cocktails uh, on X or Twitter, uh, Instagram, Threads, and Mastodon. Also, you can also subscribe and follow us on YouTube. Uh, hit the little bell to know when we get notified or get notified when we are publishing. And uh, don't forget to rate us on either Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We've had a few of you do that. Really appreciate it. It helps the show so much if you give us a five star rating. It's always fun to see what you guys say in the you know when you actually write the review because you guys are pretty witty. It's kind of fun to to, to see what you write. Uh, so please go ahead and do something. You know, maybe talk about how handsome Ben is or you know something like that. That would be great. Um, I guess that's going to do it for us, Ben. Until next week. Uh, cheers, my friend. Cheers, Matthew. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Giant Cocktails Podcast. Until next time, bottoms up. Are you gonna, oh my god. Are you going to are you going to apply? Are you going to apply for the job? As hobo? No, as GM, you can't be hobo. Buster's hobo. B- Buster's Mr. That's President. Right. Oh, if 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 I see the if it's on an indeed, I'm definitely applying. I mean, I I like the idea of servant leader. Like that's the kind of leader I am. That's the kind Me of guy too. I want to be. I'm I'm a servant leader. No, you're not. You can do that. Yeah, I am. No, you're not. I mean, you, no, you're not. Welcome. <coughs> Frog in my throat.